Thank you everybody for coming and being with us today. I know it's been a long conference. There's been lots going on um, and it's a hot and warm day in Oxford. And so I could imagine that you might have other places to be, but we're very glad that you're here with us um, at this point. So thanks for staying with us to this, uh, to this last session. Um, and so of course, for many of you, cities are extremely familiar, no doubt. Um, but as Audrey said, cities tend to be a bit on the margins of the debate about nature-based solutions. And so what we wanted to do is give them a bit of central focus by bringing together a panel of speakers who are going to share with us their experience of working with and learning about how cities are engaging with the idea of nature-based solutions. We're going to hear examples from Europe, uh, from Africa and from China through our session today. Two of our speakers are online. The first two, uh, unfortunately, Elena is not able to be with us in person because she also has COVID. Um, and Linjun is up very, very late in China to, to be with us today. So Linjun is getting extra cups of coffee bought for her, uh, I hope, by somebody over there. Um, and so why is it that, uh, and then, sorry, then the other three colleagues are here with me in the room. So just to say, we'll have two online speakers first, and then the three, um, three colleagues, Rob, Jess, and Harriet. And you get two Harriets in the session, which is unusual as well. So that's good. Uh, so they are all with us in the room, and we'll go to those uh, speakers in person um, then. And so why is it that we need to be thinking about cities and nature-based solutions then? Well, some of you will have, I guess, your own ideas about why it's important. Uh, but some of the things we need to think about is not only that cities are half of the world's population, I always like to think that that's the half Earth we should be focusing on rather than the other half Earth, preserve the nature. Anyway, that's a bit controversial. Uh, but uh, the other kind of reasons that we need to be thinking about is that uh, cities are, are responsible for around 75% of energy-related greenhouse gas emissions. So whatever we can do to start to try to reduce the amount of energy that's used in cities is going to be vital to actually staying within our climate limits. And nature-based solutions potentially have a really strong role to play there. Cities are also, of course, at the forefront of many climate disasters in terms of both the capital assets, but most importantly, the kind of populations who are affected by climate change. So we need to be thinking about if we want nature-based solutions to be part of a climate adaptation story, we really need to be thinking about how they can work in cities as well. And then we've got, you know, obvious concerns about the role of the consumption of city dwellers, but also the direct impacts of cities on the environment in terms of biodiversity and water systems, which allow for natural um, natural ecosystems to thrive as well. So we've got lots of different reasons why we need to bring cities into the fore. Um, we're not really in this session going to so much focus on the problems that cities cause for the environment, but I think because at this point in a conference, we also want to know about what's working on the ground and what kinds of solutions um, people are actually, you know, delivering. We're going to be hearing from across diverse kinds of actors from government, from research, from the Environment Agency, from the His Natural History Museum, and from organizations of cities about what are all of these different kinds of urban actors doing to actually bring nature-based solutions into the urban realm and what's working on the ground and what are some of the challenges in doing that. So I think without further ado, we'll get going. And the idea is that we're going to have all five presentations, one after the another. I've asked colleagues to speak for about eight minutes, and I am pretty strict as a chair. Uh, so I'm hoping that we'll then end up with a large amount of time at the end for panel discussion and Q&A. So I'm, I know that you will all have lots of questions. Uh, I'm going to... You know, Anybody who's been with me in a session before now knows that I also have questions. <laughs> so so uh, I'll kick off probably the panel with a couple of uh, questions for us to get going and then welcome online participants and those in the room to uh, share your questions with us. So I'm hoping we're going to get a really good debate also at the end of this session. So stay with us and we'll get there. So um, Elena, uh, thank you so much for being able to join us. I hope you're not feeling too awful and that you're... <laughs> that you're uh, going to recover well, but lovely to see you. I'm looking forward to your presentation. So I'll let you introduce yourself briefly and get into your presentation. Lovely to see you. Hello, Harriet. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome and for having me. Um, yeah, very sorry I can't be there in person. I was, I was very much looking forward to being there and meeting loads of you, but uh, sadly that was not meant to be. Um, well, thank you. My name is Alana Bada. So I am a Purpose and Funding Officer in the Green Infrastructure Fund team at Nature Scott. Um, Nature Scott is Scotland's environment agency. Um, the Green Infrastructure Fund, or the GIF short, 
is a European Regional Development Fund, or ERBF, strategic intervention, and we administer £15 million worth of GAP funding on behalf of the Scottish Government. Uh, so ERDF is an outcomes-focused economic and social fund. It's not an environmental fund. So the GIF is innovative and unusual in that it uses blue-green infrastructure as the principal mechanism to make an impact on the ground and on policy. The fund delivers projects at a range of scales, and it's the largest intervention of its kind in Scotland. Uh, since 2016, um, we've allocated funding to 25 public and third sector organisations to deliver both capital infrastructure and community engagement projects. And they all deliver locally determined solutions to evidence social, economic and environmental needs. Um, together with our match funding, our projects are delivering over £40 million pounds worth of on-the-ground work helping to create better places and enhance quality of life. Many are transforming vacant and derelict land sites, integrating outdoor learning, food growing, active travel, travel, habitat creation and ecological networks, flood management and floods, with active community involvement and management. These images here are from Fernbury Meadows, a former derelict golf course that was transformed by South Lanarkshire Council into a vibrant urban park with and for the community. It's now a designated local nature reserve. Our other projects range from one and a half hectare neighborhood scale projects to 110 hectare transformational regeneration. And these are exemplars of what can be delivered. Uh, we're also championing the embedding of true NBS uh, principles in planning, delivery and governance which are universally acknowledged as key barriers to implementing NBS more widely along with knowledge and skills gap. So in 2014, we made the case to the Scottish Government for a strategic intervention to fund community-driven, outcomes-focused blue-green infrastructure projects that create multiple benefits for communities in deprived areas of urban Scotland, where there is a deficit of good quality green space and a concentration of vacant and derelict land. It would also be an early demonstrator of the new European Commission program on nature-based solutions and renaturing cities. We highlighted that Scotland's economic, social and environmental challenges are interconnected, affecting areas of multiple deprivation disproportionately. These maps here show the proximity of vacant and derelict land sites in North Glasgow, so those are the grey areas on the left, with areas of multiple deprivation on the right. So the stronger the red, the more deprived an area is. And you can see the clear correlation, and this is replicated across other urban areas. And in Glasgow, 60% of Glaswegians live within 500 metres of such a site. And doing so tends to bring many negative multiplier effects, and again, disproportionately impacting on health and well-being. Poor and degraded local environments like these have adverse impacts on people's perceptions and use of the outdoors. And in deprived areas, fewer people have access to local green space within five minutes walk of their home. They're less likely to visit the outdoors or local green space and are twice as likely to rate the quality of their local landscape as poor. And 10 years ago, only one in four people living in the 15% most deprived areas rated their neighborhood as a very good place to live. In contrast, People who have green space close to where they live are four times more likely to use it regularly and in turn are more likely to describe themselves as being in good or very good health. And this is all before we take into account the multiplier effects of climate change. We argued that improving and creating multifunctional blue green infrastructure provides a relatively low cost option with significant scope to contribute to a wide range of Scottish government policies and priorities. Uh, from reducing inequalities to improving healthy lifestyles, building community capacity, mitigating and adapting to climate change, and benefiting biodiversity. We considered it an essential part of a modern approach to placemaking, helping our towns and cities attract inward investment, meeting community needs, and enhancing quality of life on multiple levels. These are the five outcomes our grantees deliver and measure, as well as the RDF's three themes, how they do this is up to the projects and the community needs that they serve. Each project is built on co-design, co-production and co-management with the community, delivered and financed by a range of stakeholders and with long-term monitoring and evaluation and maintenance plans. Our largest project has a 60-year operational agreement between three strategic partners, all of which are public bodies. 
projects must demonstrate their contribution to locally relevant and evidence needs, as well as wider plans, policies, or strategies relating to biodiversity, access, social and economic development, flood management, and more, as well as support innovation. And as such, our projects have multiple funders that represent diverse interests and so deliver diverse benefits. So it really is about making connections and being collaborative and systemic in our approach. As our projects complete, we are seeing the impacts and hearing the stories. Across age and user groups, enjoying the outdoors has become more common and in some cases happening where it couldn't before, providing opportunities for experiencing and valuing nature and gaining the personal and social benefits of doing so. Communities have more confidence and are empowered to use and be involved in their green space and influence its management. After the fund closes next year, we will continue to monitor the long-term impacts until 2030, adding to our collective evidence base. We've shown how funding can influence what kind of projects are delivered and ensure key elements like community engagement, long-term monitoring, maintenance funding are designed in from the very beginning. And our stakeholders have a much better idea now of what multifunctional NBS can achieve, partly because we required this in design and implementation. This emphasis on additionality and optimizing wider benefits has led to one intervention for many challenges, bringing together more stakeholders, more funders, and more beneficiaries. One of the greatest learning points was that none of our projects, which deliver hugely for biodiversity and climate change, were conceptualized because of biodiversity needs. And key drivers were largely social or economic around health and flooding, and this is a major step change for us as a nature and conservation organization, where some still consider a people-centered approach as a trade-off and a threat to biodiversity outcomes, when in fact people and nature are both majorly benefiting. Broadening our horizons like this has allowed for a much greater impact than we otherwise would have ever achieved focusing solely on biodiversity. And the essential role of the community in co-design and co-management of the site is being evidenced very clearly. Without this element, the projects would not be as successful as they are or deliver across so many outcomes and policy areas. Having key people working directly with communities to channel their energies, acting as liaisons between grantees and the local community has been essential. And these need to be permanent roles, not just during project work. Dealing with the issues that we're facing is so much more than putting up bat and bird boxes or planting some trees. It's about actively linking this holistic, systemic approach into everything, particularly spatial design and planning, supply chain sustainability, procurement, health and well-being, and our partnerships and governance structures. And we invite you to please come and see what this looks like on the ground. You're very welcome um, anytime. Please do get in touch. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Elena. That was really inspiring start for our afternoon and setting the bar really high for the kinds of things we need to think about. We'll come back to lots of questions, but I know uh, people already in the chat asking where they can find out more about your projects. So I wonder whether, because you're online, maybe you could uh, put in a few links into the online space where people could then um, find out a bit more. And then we can also share that with, with colleagues here in the room uh, later on. But thank you very much. Uh, Lin Chen, welcome and thank you very much for staying up for us <laughs> this uh, this late hour uh, where you are in China. Um, we look forward to hearing more about the work that you've been doing on how nature-based solutions are coming to be part of Chinese urban uh, policy and planning. Thank you. Um, my name is Lin Jinxie and I am currently an assistant professor working at the University of Nottingham in China. Um, my research has been focusing on mainstream nature-based solutions in cities for addressing climate and biodiversity challenges. And I used to work with Harriet uh, on the Nature Vision Project as a race urban MBS in Europe. And since returning from uh, returning back to China last year, I've been studying the practices of nature-based solutions in Chinese cities. And I recently led a small project on mapping and surveying existing nature-based solutions projects in urban China. So uh, although the work is still ongoing, some preliminary findings have been generated, uh, which I think um, I would share with you in the following few minutes. 
So um, to start with, I would like to briefly introduce the survey uh, that, I, that we are currently conducting in China. So as you might all agree that context is a key factor influencing re the relevance and effectiveness of a potential solution as well as the pathways for mainstreaming that solution. So to explore promising pathways for mainstreaming urban nature-based solutions in China, it is important to understand the current forms, uh, the characteristics, functions, and types of uh, innovations of existing nature-based solutions in Chinese cities. And this can help to identify gaps as well as challenges and opportunities. So guided by three uh, main research questions listed on the left, our survey also recognizes the diverse contexts across Chinese cities. So we seek to cover four main types of cities. First is the pilot cities for climate and sustainability actions. This refers to cities that are at least piloting uh, two national experiments, including eco cities, bond city, or low carbon city in China. And the second type is cities that are listed in Chinese city development report as representative case for urban ecological development. And the third type is cities located in biodiversity hotspots areas uh, where extremely important ecosystems are located. And the fourth type uh, is resource-based cities that are undergoing uh, urban transformation and are facing diverse environmental challenges. So as mentioned, the project is still ongoing and we aim to create a database with at least 200 urban nature-based solutions projects in China. So far, we have only collected 24 cases. Um, their located cities are mapped here. Um, the number is a bit far from our goal, but as our intern, stu students intern getting more familiar with the survey, hopefully the process can speed up soon. Uh, besides desktop research, we have also conducted field studies to, con to collect first-hand data on urban nature-based solutions uh, in China. So far, we have conducted field research in five cities, and the works done so far uh, have generated some preliminary findings, and I've summarized them into five key points, which I will introduce briefly in turn. So the first is that although nature-based solutions is a new imported concept in China, the practice of working with nature has long existed in Chinese cities. So for example, on Chongming Island in Shanghai, the historical records documented the replanting practices for accelerating desalination and for consolidating lands for crop cultivation. And in the 1970s, local governments still planted reeds for riverbank protection. But nevertheless, in the past decades, engineering solutions have dominated the urban responses towards uh, various challenges. So for example, dikes and levees gradually replaced the reed landscape in the coast of Chongming. And secondly, urban nature-based solutions in China are mostly state-led and policy-driven, uh, especially related to the Bonch City program, for example. And the picture here is one of my colleagues uh, showing the students about the sponsored city uh, project practices in, in the city of Ningbo. And for this kind of projects, environmental and economic impacts are often highlighted or emphasized, but social impacts, especially for those marginal groups, are often not considered. Similarly, uh, social innovation is also seldom discovered in current nature-based solutions practices in China as technological innovations often dominated the types of innovation in current MBS practices. Thirdly, although involving concerns on the environment, urban planning and nature-based solutions project led by the government uh, here in China tend to prioritize green rather than eco. So often there's a clear target on the, in, uh, in the governmental plan in building certain number of uh, pocket parks, uh, for example, or X hectares of public green spaces, yet the quality of these parks and green spaces are seldom uh, considered, which would then lead to negligible or even negative impacts uh, on the environment and the ecology. And fourthly, um, recently, grassroots initiatives like community gardens are booming Driving, uh, driven by civil society organizations such as NGOs and ch charities, as well as local communities. 
And like the rooftop garden in Xiamen in the picture here, uh, this was initiated by several local NGOs together with the local communities. And similar practices have also been found in cities like Shanghai, Chengdu, Shenzhen, and Nanning. And it is worth noting that although being initiated by non-state actors, most of these projects receive recognition or support from the local governments during or after their implementation. And lastly, it is found that information about the monitoring and maintenance of existing nature-based solutions project in China is commonly lacking. So although we have 20, only 25 um, cases so far, nine out of these 24 nature-based solutions cases uh, uh, have monitoring information. So most of them don't have. And only two nature-based solutions cases um, have publicly disclosed information on financing the maintenance. So above are the current key findings. And in the Nature Vision project, we identified 20 stepping stones that are critical for catalyzing transformative change for mainstreaming nature-based solutions in European cities. Um, in the Chinese context, some of those stepping stones that we identified are, are especially prominent. So they are still relevant, but some of them are especially prominent. And uh, the very preliminary study has pointed out some promising directions, including valuing, diverse, uh, valuing diversity, which, makes, which means making spaces for societal innovation. And also this includes facilitating community-based actions, generating partnerships between the state and non-state actors, and also uh, improving data and monitoring, as well as emphasizing the maintenance in designing and practicing nature-based solutions projects. So as our project proceeds, we hope to gain better understanding of the landscape of urban nature-based solutions practices in China, so as to inform the exploration and also the efforts for mainstreaming. So if you are interested, please stay in tune. So uh, with this, I conclude my today's presentation and thanks to all the team members who are working with me uh, here in China and also thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Jinjin, for sharing that work, which I know is, as you said, uh, currently in process. But it's really, I mean, it's a really live results from work undergoing uh, action in China at the moment. And I think also just really interesting to see the diversity of things which are happening in Chinese cities, because we hear quite a lot about the big projects, but especially like the focus on all of these diverse actions that are taking place. So yes, so Rob, I think you're up next. And in fact, I know you're up next because the screen is telling me. <laughs> so, it's, gone it's gone very green. Lovely to have you with us this week, Rob. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here. And as Harriet says, it's been a, a brilliant week. I've, um, I've learned so much this week and um, met so many brilliant people. It's just been fantastic to improve my knowledge of what nature-based solutions are and all the, the wide-ranging aspects uh, that we've what we've discussed. So it's great to be here at the um, Nature-Based Solution Conference and be here in, in person in session um, to talk about mainstreaming um, nature-based solutions in an urban area. Um, I work for the Environment Agency and I'm a um, strategic partnership advisor. And that's all about um, working in partnership with people because we realize as an agency, a government agency, um, and all, albeit as an arm's length agency, that we, we need to work in partnership. We need to deliver with people and we need to deliver through people. So. The Environment Agency is part of the Department for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, one of many agencies that, that fit within that department. And we are a regulator and also a um, provider of safe flood defences, but also we are also um, dealing with pollution incidents and an enforcer. And that's what people see us about. But more importantly than that, we are a partner. And as I say, we like to deliver with people and through people as well. So. What we want to try and do is, is create a better place for people and wildlife. And we've got three long long term goals, basically, and it's, it's, it's about resi um, resilience to climate change, improving hair, hair? <laughs> yeah, it's because I've got them, <laughs> improving air, um, land and water, but also looking at green growth and making that growth sustainable. And it's linked to the government, the UK government's 25 year plan for the environment. I had a quick look at the um, government's 25 year plan for the environment and it doesn't actually mention explicitly nature based solutions, although it mentions nature nearly 100 times and it mentions urban 33 times. So it's in there, but it's not explicitly um, explained 
as um, nature-based solutions. So what I wanted to do today in, in the, the few minutes that I've got is to talk to you about the journey that I've been through in looking to mainstream urban nature-based solutions. Um, I think, where do I start? I start with this, with this picture and looking at something that originally we thought was too difficult um, and then thinking, well, how, how do I make it less difficult? Um, starting the conversation, starting the conversation about nature-based solutions. And I think at the time of this particular project, that I'm talking about here, the Tyne Estuary project, where a partnership was formed. The partnership was formed to try and improve an urban um, estuary, but also look at the, the wider benefits with, within that estuary in the um, delivery of, of urban nature-based solutions. And I would say that nature-based solutions, when I started this, wasn't even in my vocabulary. I, I, I called it different things, green infrastructure, working with natural processes, etc. So a big part of my job is talking to strategic partnerships, who you would think particularly would be the important partnerships, people like local authorities, water companies, infrastructure providers, government departments, um, enterprise partnerships and business. But what I would say is they are very important partners, they are very strategic, but the most important partners that you can talk to are the local communities. And the local communities have taken us on the journey and made all of the, um, the challenges that we've come across um, a little bit easier to, to get across the line. And it's really important to talk about those partners um, and those communities because it's their place, it's where they live, it's where they work and where they play, and it's, it's where they want the, the improvements in their environment to happen, um, especially around climate change and the biological emergencies, which they may not particularly think they're talking about, but they are, and it, it's just their perception of, of the language. So you've got to be able to get the language right within that partnership. Um, so we've got over 70 plus partners in this partnership, and they range from, from very different um, individuals and organisations. Some are really really involved and some aren't, um, some come, some go, and some just want to be kept informed and in the loop. Um, and what I would say is the importance of this strategic partnership is that if we hadn't formed it and had the strength of that partnership, many of the challenges that we came across, we would not have got across the line. And I think um, one of the things that I remember about the Nativation Project is talking about really strong roots. And these are really strong roots in this partnership. You've got those 70 plus um, organizations really pushing in the same direction. So mainstreaming. Um, when you're looking at a project, it's really important to think about as, as much as you possibly can beforehand. And I would say one of the things you've got to think about um, is the evidence that you've got. Have you got the evidence that something actually needs to be done? Have you got the commitment or the will of the people and your partnership that they want to be involved with it? Um, is it? Is it water quality? Is it flooding? Is it carbon? Is it economy? Is it just transition? It could be one or all of those things. Some will float to the top and some will be further down, but they'll all be part of the equation somewhere. Um, also, it's really important to think who will take the lead, who will convene this. And that's part of the thing that's linked to funding as well, because it's great having this idea, but you still need funding to get these things off the ground. You still need funding to bring people together to have this conversation. Is there an opportunity that you can build around as well? This has been really important in the, um, in the development of this project and the things that we've done. Is it a new development? Is it a new regulation? Is it a tagline? Is it a pollution incident? Is it, is it an interest group? All these different things can help you create a partnership to then start and deliver um, urban nature-based solutions. Can you build a vision? Can you build something around a landscape, a history, an iconic species, a culture, something that really brings people together in order to move these things forward? The, um, the project that we, we pulled together, we did um, a feasibility and we identified this is, this is the river from the, um, the North Sea all the way up to the, um, the tidal limit of the Tyne Estuary. And we identified 77 enhancement opportunities, which you would link some more than others to nature-based solution interventions. But some of them have definitely got the, the, the key elements that you would think of nature-based solutions. So the next stage is that we looked at within this um, formation of the partnership and all these 77 interventions that we've got is, is how we, we come over these, um, these, these issues. So it's, as I said, it's difficult enough to get funding just for um, bringing the partnership together, but you're also going to get funding together for um, 
doing the, the design of the interventions, let alone actually delivering them. And you've got to think about it, a landscape like an estuary. Um, you're not going to be able to improve the whole estuary. You're only going to do little pockets, and that links back to those 77 sort of small interventions. So we're nibbling away at it. But what we want to do is connect all those interventions together as best we can. And these interventions that we're doing are all about um, piloting and showcasing the art of the possibility. So we're looking to nibble away and put these interventions in, but then go big go big and scale them up where we can, but also add into that, not just the impacts of, um, on nature and the impacts that they would address with climate change, but also look at the wider benefits like health and wellbeing, et cetera. But also as we are going through these projects, there are a lot of hidden costs. And these are some things that you maybe don't necessarily um, jump out of you at, at, at first. So you've got to look at planning, you've got to look at consents, permissions, who's going to maintain it, the legal agreements, potential contamination, the heritage aspects, all the cultural aspects, all these things need to be brought together. And although we've got this overarching, really strong um, partnership in the Thai Estuary Partnership, all the interventions are in different places and they're all different communities. So you've got to think about those individual communities that you're working with as well. And those communities are all different and in different areas. So maybe um, deprived areas, so maybe business areas, but it's the opportunities that you need to look at. This image here is at, um, about half a kilometre of um, riverbank, which was um, used for the coal mining industry. And the coal from, from the area used to be put onto ships and shipped down to London to, to generate the um, Industrial Revolution. Um, but when the ships came back, they were full of ballast from London um, and from the south. And this ballast used to be dumped on the bank sides. Um, and that, that, that's lost all the salt marsh that would have been there. 98% of the salt marsh on the Thai estuary has disappeared over the last few centuries. So this was our attempt to try and put a, a, a fairly cheap intervention in there, um, which would create um, sedimentation behind it, and then the salt marsh would come back. And you can see the, the picture below actually showed that. And that, that was only within a, in a few weeks of the actual interventions being done. The... A big part of the partnership is having those ears to the ground and a really strong partnership will have those ears to the ground and bring them back to the overall partnership. And this was an example here of old industrial heritage, wet docks from the shipbuilding industry, which had been derelict for, for decades and also contaminated land next to it. It's been forgotten. The community isn't looking at it, but it's right there with culture and heritage. And um, talking to local planners, and um, we identified that this was then going to be a redevelopment site. And this redevelopment site was going to have um, lots of housing on it, but the housing was going to be facing away from these derelict docks um, because the saw it is too big of a problem. We don't know what to do with it. We fence it off and we face away from it. But having the conversations and the feasibilities that we'd had done, we've, we've turned that round. And now the developers and the local community want to face those docks. They're going to be made safe. They're going to be planted up. There's going to be... Um, uh, oysters put in there, there's going to be mussel beds put in there, and also you're going to have the, the vegetation that's going to be in there as well. So it's going to be part of the community and it's going to be a green space that they can be really proud of and really proud of because it's part of their culture and heritage and they're not losing it. Another example um, that I've got very quickly, looking at Harriet for my time, is um, in within um, Newcastle upon Tyne itself. Newcastle upon Tyne, very very urbanised area, as, as you can imagine. And these are the old key walls. Um, obviously, shipbuilding is a big part of, um, and, and manufacturing, big part of the Industrial Revolution within Tyneside. And this water body is just being altered within an inch of its life, basically. It's very little nature around there. It's canalised. Um, and what we've done here is we've, we've managed to get some funding um, to put in floating ecosystems. This is just a mock-up because we're actually installing it next week. And the installation will be with communities, schools, different sea scouts, different people, but also businesses as well. Businesses are coming down to see that because this is the business district and also the tourist district within Newcastle. And it's got a really, really vibrant tourist and visitor um, history. And the local enterprise district um, want to bring extra people in so they will come and spend the economy they will linger they will stay longer um but also what we want to do is take people's eye away from looking over the river and looking at the wonderful bridges that we've got on the river time and into the river themselves so they can see what's going on in there and reconnect the communities which are the business communities the tourist communities but also the wider Tyneside community in into this um area and this has helped us get funding um 
This has helped us get funding from several different sources. We've got grant and aid funding. We've got some from the, um, the business district, but we've also got some sponsorship from um, industry as well. So that's been really, really successful. So what I would say is the, um, the journey that we're on here is, is, is really important. It's difficult to get nature-based solutions across the whole urban area. You've got to do it in pockets. And having that strong partnership with those routes has been key to making sure that these interventions are going ahead and we've also got another about with a dozen interventions across that estuary where we're actually going to be um, moving those forward as well and hopefully demonstrate to everybody that we can do more for their money and also get more investment into the project. Yeah, my name is Jess Kalanick um, and I'm head of implementation. At yeah, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. Can yeah. you take your um, lanyard off? Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. I've already had mine removed, so cool. <laughs> okay, that'll be fine. Thank you so much. So I'm head of implementation um, at C40 Cities, but prior to this, I was a uh, program manager for a program called Urban Natural Assets for Africa, or UNA for short. This program worked in 11 African cities across the continent, and it was its main aim was to, to protect urban natural assets in those cities. So wetlands, mangroves, rivers, forests, whatever was, was critical for, for those cities. Um, and we did this through through multiple approaches and multiple um, things from planning to policy to actually on the ground implementation. Um, and one of those key elements was mainstreaming. So I can't talk on the whole program. It, it ran for eight years, um, but I just thought I'd tell a little story about some of the things we, we did. It's the end of the day, so I thought I would even do some really bad drawings for my little cover pages for the stories. Um, but I, I called to you to, to look for those little nuggets in the story. Um, that talk around opportunities and challenges in African cities. Um, that also touches on kind of methodologies or implementation strategies that we tested. Um, and then also look at kind of things that relate to community engagement, planning, finance, and government and governance, because those are absolutely critical for mainstreaming in Africa. The story is completely true, except for minor, minute details that I've made up just to kind of link, link the story together. It is a hot and dry, dry day in Lilongwe, the capital of Malawi. Alan Kwanjana is a little boy who loves to spend his time outside. The more time he spends outside, the more he can see that huge percentages of his community rely on the natural asset base for their survival. He has seen how this community that has more green spaces has less impact to flooding. And he can feel that his green community is cooler because of the trees, but he doesn't understand why. And more importantly, he doesn't understand why people are cutting down the trees at such a fast rate when he feels in his bones that they provide so much back to his community. Right then, he decides to pursue a job as a city official in the Longway City Council to protect nature. He studies hard and becomes an environmentalist at the city. He works for three long and very, very hard years and he becomes angrier and angrier with his progress in mainstreaming nature and nature solutions like MBS. He asks himself the following questions. Why as an environmentalist does he only get asked to provide information on nature when the planners are the ones making decisions? There's a clear breakdown on who holds the information and who makes the decisions. Why is there no budget for me to do anything? Why does it all come from national government and then we are just told to spend it like they see. Things are still so centralized. And why does every MBS proposal I submit to a funder come back as unbankable? Why is there no data for me to make informed decisions? And why do we as individuals who have such a close connection to nature, but is given no agency in decision making? The solutions we use at home are not given weight in governance, planning or decision making space. The scale is all wrong. And finally, in reflecting on these challenges, he began to think of answers. What could he do to overcome this? What were his opportunity? What were the opportunities that existed? And what methods could he use to mainstream nature-based solutions? With support from the UNO program, he decided that he needed to bridge the divide between environmentalists, planners, and finance officers of the city. He worked very hard to break down these silos between these departments, bringing everybody together in multilateral dialogues. He then spent a huge amount of time building relationship with national government. There's a very, very long way to go, but he hopes this will help funding flow. 
governance, and in particular multi-level governance, is absolutely critical in African cities. But data, this is and will always be an issue. But why not develop a prioritization map of the most important natural assets? The ones that have lost will really impact the resilience of the communities. This map can then be used as a decision-making tool that puts nature at the forefront. This differs from a land use map as urban sprawl is happening too fast in the city and there's no capacity to enforce these land use maps. This urbanization map is different because it guides the city to know where to spend their efforts in protecting and rehabilitating and where nature-based solutions are therefore critical. This guides the city on where nature-based solution efforts will in fact bring the most benefits, such as working lands rather than ad hoc city center. He also used this tool for improving community awareness. He spends so much time reviewing funder requirements rather than packaging his own ideas into a project. So that he rather aligned with what they were funding and what their priorities. And then he brought nature-based solutions and the city context and needs into those ideas as solutions. He developed pre-feasibility studies and investment cases, an effort to develop a pipeline of projects for green infrastructure. He continually works hard to try and score the immense benefits of nature in the city so that he can keep making their case effectively to policymakers. He reviewed the city budget and the grant projects that the city was receiving to see how he could embed nature-based solutions into what the city was already doing as a replacement to some other ideas rather than reinventing the wheel and starting from scratch. He complemented this by looking at how his city's climate action plan and pulled out relevant nature targets. He tried hard to align the city's biodiversity plan and the city's local climate plan with solutions that would work for both. He made sure to then get these targets and the nature components of other projects into his co colleagues' key performance indicators so they were reviewed on progress annually. And finally, in nature-based solution designs, he put co-design at the forefront, bringing together all relevant stakeholders in the city Indigenous communities were centre at this design. Eight years later, he looked back at all his efforts and realised that there's still a very, very long way to go. However, he was proud of the incremental achievements he had made. Urban areas are critical in the nature-based solution dialogue. The end. Thank you, Jess. And I promise that we didn't actually uh, organise it in this way, but I'm inviting Harriet now to share also the work of telling stories and storytelling. Um, that she does as well in the Natural History Museum in London. So Harriet, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's really nice to be here with you all. Thank you for inviting me and having me. Um, so yeah, I work at the Natural History Museum as part of a project team. Uh, it's the Urban Nature Project and uh, one of our slogans. It's amazing working. I've always previously worked in small organisations. So having a large organisation that has a marketing team and does you PowerPoint templates and slides and slogans is all the new world for me. So um, that's, uh, we're starting to try and do it across the country. So nature on the street near you, uh, wherever you are in the country. So we've got partner museums and we're looking at what kind of engagement means. We've done a lot of consultation in the beginning stages of the project for yeah, how, what good practice is happening, how I met Harriet in the first place and what advice people had for us and the kind of reason of what we were doing. And that is that within cities, there is a lot of nature to be found, but people don't really see it unless it's the big dynamic things. People don't see it as nature. We've got a site that I'll talk to you about later, but the thing that really underlined it to me is it's a small nature garden. And we did a lot of research about our audiences and how they were using it one of the kids was like well where is the nature in the nature garden because the plants and the insects and the thing the birds that fly off because people are there don't register to them as nature so the kind of trying to show the stories of what is there and why that's interesting and how they all link together is one of the big things of the project so on a national level we are um doing a series of sort of citizen science projects so we're doing seasonal four projects where we're asking people to monitor things that are really common. Um, we've had a slime search for snails, fat spider week for October, where you suddenly see loads of spiders around, um, and then a national um, schools program, uh, and then a monitoring the 
the health of the trees on your, your street. And I found that that kind of involving women the science and looking at using tools like iNaturalist, where you can uh, send your data in, it's actually a really good way of giving people a reason to go out. Uh, people, particularly with well-being challenges or are new to nature and don't really know what they're looking for or why stare at a bush or why is what you're seeing potentially interesting. It gives them a way of taking part and a different reason to do those things. Um, so, so that's a little bit more about it, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each of these slides. Um, it did have some good uptake. We found better uptake with the um, Fat Spider Fortnite than we did with sales. <laughs> um, and I think it is about finding those things where people do notice it, like huge spiders in October is a thing. And people are a bit oh, about spiders in general. Looking for snails in January, February, I think maybe we were asking less of a thing. So tapping into the things where people already have a why are there suddenly ants everywhere flying around? Why are those big spiders? That kind of stuff. Um, oh, sorry. So before I go on to what's happening on site at the museum, the other national side of things that I didn't put slides together for is that we were also uh, looking at kind of emerging science monitoring uh, techniques and how to understand what nature is doing in cities, because nature is doing different things in urban environments to what it is doing in the countryside. And so how do we best understand it to then best be able to uh, create new spaces, protect the spaces we've got, all of the reasons you know about. Um, particularly exciting looking at eDNA techniques and being able to take a very small sample of soil, air, water, and tell anything that's walked through that soil, uh, moved through that soil, gone through the water, gone through the air, you can tell. They don't know what the time period is, but you get this huge amount of data that tells you. And once that starts becoming more embedded, once we start getting the database of what actually those e the DNA strands relate to, hopefully it will become quite a cheap and quite easy way, comparatively, for small sites to be able to know exactly what is using their site. So that's kind of on a national scale. Then it's uh, got a on-site element, which is where my role particularly comes in. So we're transforming the forming the gardens of the museum. Currently, they are um, mostly utility uh, grassland, um, sort of utility, yeah, and then a small nature garden space at the back, wildlife garden. We're changing it so that the path of the, the way into the museum, the kind of main path in, tells the story of evolution over time. And we're trying to give that context of how much change has happened on this planet but the rate of change how slow it's been until we've got humans on the scene so looking we know from our research that people don't really understand that sense of deep time they don't really get what it means like how long dinosaurs were on the earth how long before there was anything the pace of change that is taken and the interrelationship from the geology to the plants to everything how it all fits together so that's the kind of huge story we're telling in a very small uh, to sort of yeah walk across the museum and then on the uh, that gives you a kind of overview of the gardens we've got so the one half of the the kind of central carriage ramp is that story it is a small space with a big story and then the other half is the wildlife garden that we've got currently and expanding it to come around to the front so it's more accessible more seen more used um, the whole space to be more accessible for people with access needs as well being a priority for the project um, and also seeing how we can make that um, nature space more usable for groups because currently it's it's nice and it's nice to walk around but there's not much to do in it and without things to do people don't use it unless they already know how to use it or want to use it often um so that's little bit of an overview of the West Garden and the courtyard. We've currently got a courtyard that we're also depaving to look at what can be the future of, uh, of, of what happens with nature in cities. If we get a climate that's more like Barcelona, what trees will survive? Actually, what can we do and how can we start yeah, depaving and looking at a future in this country? Um, so my work is uh, really on the ground and really with audiences. So I'm uh, looking at learning and volunteering and volunteering being 
not just actually our volunteers, also being apprenticeships and paid ways into to work. So we're not just relying on volunteers. And my principal uh, driver on it, involvement, want for it, is about how we actually look at who isn't engaging currently and how do we open up and actually go to see what the barriers are and address those barriers for people not engaging currently in the conservation sector, in nature, or with us as a museum as well. We have very similar uh, crossovers on the, the wider sector. Um, and I think that's also one of the things that's really important, obviously, about cities is they're hugely diverse, vibrant places, and you've got nature right on the doorstep of these people that might not know or want to go out hiking or camping or all the rest of it, but actually do have nature right there that you can think. And if we're trying to come up with solutions, we need, need everyone's voice in that space. So how do we involve everybody to be part of that conversation to see the value? And for me, my background's in education. So also that kind of, if you don't see, if you don't see something, if you don't have it as value in your life, you're not going to protect it or want to keep it. That kind of quote that often, I don't know, we attribute it to Attenborough, but I think that's totally wrong and it came from before. But um, yeah, so that, how do we involve a diverse range of children? So we, or, and young people. So we started uh, some consultation stuff. We had, we've had two youth panels. We had a first youth panel from young people from diverse ethnic backgrounds, looking at the barriers particularly they faced, and then also giving them budget and space to come up with an intervention in that space. So it wasn't just depressingly talking about the problems, they got to do something. Um, and currently we're talking with young people from across the UK about nature in their city and how we communicate to other young people about what you can find within a city or urban context. Um, partnerships has been really key and as has been across all of the things. We're not doing that well in reaching diverse audiences and it's not surprising because there's a whole hierarchy of needs that we're like they're embedded but we're quite far up in the way that we talk so actually going to the the people that are working with communities right on the ground that are looking at food poverty that are looking at providing tech access during the pandemic that are looking at like these really basic needs what are people doing and what do they want from us how can we in any way align what we're doing with what they're already doing they've got the relationships they've got the trust and then what trying to work at the pace of trust looking at how we do what they want from us and then build in a conversation about the work we're doing and those kind of things. But then also going to the people who are already active in that space and doing similar things to what we want to do, but don't have resource. I come from a small community garden background and you're constantly having to apply for new funds that make you do a new project and a new project and a new thing when you're doing something you know works you've got an audience that come in my case it was children coming every day for free after play non-book sessions so you had a hugely diverse audience base and they loved coming they had their group they were doing all the things you want them to do and we didn't want to constantly say we're doing a new thing and we're going to solve the world through this new thing you want them to just keep you going to things so looking at how with our funding as a big major national player how can we raise up the presence of other smaller groups that are already doing that and how can we share the funding and share some of our goals and that sort of stuff um, so this is one partnership with a, a small organization who actually have got a lot of prominence uh, recently it's fantastic showing at chelsea garden but um we created a partnership garden with an organization called grow to know something they requested on the estate where they're based and then um, we are looking at co-producing one of the installations in our new garden from their, their narrative and what they want to say about why space is important to them. Um, the developing stories bit, we're also looking at whose story do we tell. In our um, engagement activities, we're looking at really foregrounding um, stories that are of relevance to people from the global south and that, that sort of heritage. So it's a huge area so we've gone we've gone down we looked at how we did that and we've stuck uh we we're one of the thing we're currently working on is using anansi stories where it's a really broad uh story tradition that's known very well across west africa and across the caribbean and some of Af americas the kind of the diaspora of enslaved people moved with that 
and it's it's provided this way of yeah using a narrative um, that is recognizable and hopefully through working with audiences to also try and mean that it actually carries their story in a way that's meaningful to people who are from that heritage not just us telling that story we're hoping that it shows a sort of an invite and a welcome because it's also about not just expecting people to come it's about going out and actually saying yeah what do you want how do you how do we visit you what what are the barriers how do we link we'd really like to hear from you we'd really like you to be part of this volunteering part of the story come to visit whatever it is that you can say as a part of um and i had a different thought in the middle of saying that that has disappeared the um oh the importance of story also and the why have a narrative base to that activity is because it's got to be about fun and it's got to be about the thing that we did with our youth worker training was learning by stealth and it's got to be because it's a fun activity to engage with the power of story the power of a game the power of an activity is the way to get a new audience to connect join up with what is of interest to them what they're already doing or what is just a good thing to do for for your own enjoyment in the moment so that's been really key um and so we see here and so also in trying to work again with youth workers with the holders of that relationship already i think youth workers are really overlooked quite often the kind of the adventure playgrounds the sector that have these really trusted relationships with people who aren't engaging with a lot of other services and i think there's a real opportunity for the sector that we don't always take to yeah to look at where are those grassroots relational kind of organizations uh, i think that was just about all yeah to say thank you. fantastic harriet thank you so much um so i'm just now going to invite uh colleagues to join on the panel i've got a low battery with only five percent remaining i don't know whether that's going to be a problem so i'll just leave that there for a minute um, and i'm going to take that so i know what time it is yes yeah, yeah yeah it's all good um so I hope you found all of those talks as inspiring and as interesting as I did. Um, and I'm just going to allow you to have a little bit of time to kind of gather your thoughts and think about questions uh, while I start a, a little bit of a discussion, because I think there were some kind of core themes that were running through all the all the presentations that I would really like to pick up. Pick up. Uh, we're going to be able to have the other colleagues as yeah. well. They're coming. They're going to beam in from the ether at any point on one of your screens. Well, we'll see. Uh, see the other. So I might just then start with a question directly that I was thinking that perhaps um, Harriet and Rob, you could uh, you could sort of respond to me. I'm really interested in this idea of being able to spot the opportunities and spot the needs in the communities. So, like Rob, you talked about like identifying when there was an opportunity. And Harriet, you talked about going out and finding what it was that people were doing already, and then how can you bring the thing, the nature, and the kind of concerns that you have into that space? So, in two two slightly different ways about talking about it, but they were both about taking what we're interested in to us, to a place, or to a site, or to a group, rather than expecting it to kind of come to us. So, I just wondered whether you could just reflect a little bit more on that and what you learned through doing that. I'll ask Rob. You've got the mic, Rob. So. <laughs> I think it's it, it's really interesting to see how those opportunities do come because they come from all sorts of different places. And the examples that I was talking about there with the partnerships is that the partnership is made up of so many different people from so many different organisations and communities that they've got they've got the the understanding of, of things that are coming up in their their particular area and that they're really keen to to bring it as an idea because they want something in their area to actually to, to be put forward. Um, whether it's a councillor who represents um, a, a community, a, you know, a housing estate or, or something like that, that they'll bring those opportunities. But also through the, um, the planning and regulation side of it as well, if you've got your local authorities and your planners on there, they're, they're more willing to come to you to ask about the questions um, about the opportunities for nature-based solutions. And that, that's sometimes how the regulation fits in, because as regulation changes, um, we've, we've talked a lot about biodiversity net gain and, and mitigation over the, over the last few days. And um, certainly the UK government is bringing regulations in through that, which then makes those organisations like the developers think, actually, we, we need to have the conversation. And actually, there's a really strong partnership there. Let's talk to that partnership and see how the ideas can come forward. Um, so business as well. Business is really 
interested now in, to, in thinking um, not just through carbon credits and biodiversity net gain credits and, and all that green finance malarkey, which I don't even pretend to, to understand, but they're interested in doing something where they're actually working, where, they, where their um, employees work, live and play as well. Um, so I think that's a really important part of it. Thank you, Rob. Um, Harriet, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the, the kind of approach we've gone down is, no. <laughs> um, yeah, looking both for the opportunities for where things tie up and also, yeah, for that, for the needs and trying to understand the what what is it that they want to do and that we, through having, yeah, potentially more resource or a different set of things can help them to achieve for where they are. And in understanding the barriers as well, I think for us, it was also really important that we weren't just going to them for endless meetings and not yeah. like partly we can do the, yeah, what, what can we help you achieve? But when we're trying to understand what the barriers are, it ends up being a lot of meetings for time stretched people for, for us to learn more and for our work again. So with the youth panel, we paid them for their time. We were able to, because we're project funded, but yeah, the approach always was, yeah, how can we actually do something that, that works? And if not, then where can we learn, learn separately? Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I think what, just sort of building a little bit on that, one of the things I also noticed from a lot of the, discussions or a lot of the information that was shared was just how many hoops um, that you have to be jumping through to get your projects funded, right? And, and then also about the reporting side and about how much, you know, how much data, how much knowledge do you need at what stage in the process as well? There's what do you need before you get going and then there's how do you have to monitor and report on it afterwards? But I, I thought it was quite interesting to think about the role then of data and science. And in fact, somebody's asked us a question online about that as well. So Elena, in, in your project, you had, I think, quite a, an interesting approach to how you were dealing with, with the data and the indicators. As I understand it, there were sort of core goals that you wanted all projects to meet, but how they directly met them, they could decide for themselves. Could you explain that a little bit more for us? Because I think that's a really intriguing approach and perhaps something that you know it's been a bit in the conversation in in the room over the last uh, few days is how do we balance this needing to have some kind of baselines and performance indicators and things which want to be achieved but at the same time not making it so onerous that all of these different community groups and actors who want to get involved find themselves completely stymied by the amount of data and information that's needed so maybe you could just explain a little bit more and then Jess I'll come to you yes of course can you hear me okay Oh, perfect. Yeah, so it, it, we are slightly differently set up in that these five outcomes really guide um, what we'd like to have happen without us being prescriptive of what it needs to be. Um, and we very much leave that up to um, the projects and the communities involved because they need to determine what they're, you know, the needs that they need to have met, what their issues are and how they can best meet them. Um, our role really was to use these five outcomes to help create that, um, I suppose, joined up thinking, so a move away from siloed thinking, whether it's just about biodiversity or just about flooding, but really tying things together um, with and keeping communities at the heart of it, because really it's, it's, it's for the communities, it's not for us. Um, and, and we know from previous projects, if, if anybody goes to say, we think you need to do this there, it's not going to last beyond the funded project period, if, if at all. Um, and so it's set up in this way. And it, in terms of our monitoring and evaluation, we have some core um, indicators um, and measures that are common across all of our projects so that there is a common baseline that they all share, but they can also identify what, what they would like to measure against that are specific to, to their project, to their community, to their outcomes and goals and needs. Um, and indeed, we, can, we, we break the, the monitoring and evaluation side of thing, things down into kind of three areas. One is the kind of outcome measures that I mentioned. So these can be things like um, the amount of green space created or access, you know, people accessing um, and those, those baseline and those kind of more 
um, custom measures for the projects. And we also have um, more um, kind of larger scale results indicators in the form of national surveys. So when I mentioned some of the statistics in my talk about um, satisfaction with green space and things like that, those are all statistics that come from our national surveys that we have access to and that we also contribute to. Um, and, and we'll be looking to get the results of those as those surveys comes, come out over the years and see what kind of change there is. And, and therein lies a challenge as well. How can we exactly differentiate the impact of a project that we fund versus something else? Um, and then we also have other process measures, and that's something that we as a um, the administrative agency um, kind of run in terms of the number of grantees we have, how it all works, the, the, the process behind the scenes oriented things. Um, but it's, it is a really interesting setup because it does allow for that for that customization for for what community needs are um, without being prescriptive and still providing a framework. Getting those two things in balance, I think, has been one of the challenges that we've discussed uh, through throughout the last couple of days. Um, but just uh, the person who's put the question online specifically asks what this might mean and look like in a developing country context. And of course, I, I think there is also some similarity with the way that that this project happened in Lilongwe and, and other projects as well about how much data was needed and what kind of data. So you talked about rather than going for land use maps, going for a prioritization map is a different and more flexible kind of way of evaluating what was happening. But uh, if you'd like to share some of that. Yeah, um, I think it's what, what kind of the biggest struggle we, we had was, was in our story was about what data is to make informed decision and then also how do you help cities get the data that they need, but then also that it's sustainable so that it can can provide the baseline that they can use to, to kind of develop projects and proposals, but they keep adding to that database. Um, so we spend a lot of time also spending time on capacity building um, with those with those city officials. Um, but yeah, this map in particular kind of just outlined these these prioritization areas in the city so that they could say, okay, this area would be be absolutely critical if it was lost. It would impact health, it would impact um, well-being, um, flooding, temperatures would go in, go up. So they would also be able to see the system yeah. of that data. So it wasn't just like, okay, these areas are prone to flooding, but what would that mean for, for their cities to really kind of like think through that decision making kind of process, which was also really critical, I think, to getting that buy-in, particularly for policymakers. Yeah. And seeing that multifunctionality as well. So, and then the prioritizations can be where there are, maybe there's one key agenda, but where, maybe where two or three agendas come together, exactly. that also makes it, yeah. yeah. And Lin Jun, you also mentioned that so far in the cases you've looked at in China, then data, its availability, and which kind of data seems important. And we tend to think of, you know, from a from from outside of China, we, we tend to think of China as being a place where there is plenty of data about nature based solutions, but perhaps that's not always the case. So can you share your experience with how data monitoring has been a key sort of uh, issue in the work that you've seen so far? Yeah, so like I mentioned in the presentation that when it comes to specific nature-based solutions project, it doesn't matter whether it's government-led or non-government-led, there tend to be less data on the maintenance and also on the social effects. So they tend to, uh, many of the panel peer panelists mentioned about the prescriptive of the indicators of the project that happens in China as well, especially for those government-led projects. They tend to, like I mentioned, they tend to have a very specific target of the quantitative um, goal, for example, X amount of green spaces, uh, even 10 pocket parks in the city, things like that. So um, that can be very directive because that's a great momentum, right? Driving the not only the stakeholders, but also the governments and also the state-owned companies to fulfill the targets. But then that, that leads to the question about the quality of these parks created. So if they don't take into consideration, for example, the biodiversity, uh, one thing I didn't mention, or I probably already mentioned, but I just forgot <laughs> um, because it's already midnight here and I'm trying to stay focused, stay in sun here. So one thing I probably mentioned is that uh, biodiversity is still quite marginal um, here in, in China. So although many of the projects mentioned about uh, dealing with the flooding challenges, 
dealing with, um, for example, the drought challenges, but biodiversity is rarely, rarely mentioned uh, so far. But uh, I think because of the uh, COP um, to be held in Kunming, but now it's relocated. Because of that, uh, there's a raising awareness and hopefully in the future that biodiversity will be uh, taken into consideration in urban context as well. Because when it comes to biodiversity, uh, the cities or the urban is, turn is again marginalized. So, uh, okay, I'm not sure if I'm making any sense here, but yeah, I think that indicators can be two edges uh, in the practice. So try to not being too prescriptive, but at the same time, it provides the momentum to real practices, real uh, impacts. Thank you, Linton. Well, I feel yeah, I've, I've asked a lot of questions in other sessions as well. I could carry on, but oh, we have one question in the audience. I'd love to open up our discussion um, now. So please, yeah. Thanks yeah. everyone for a really lovely uh, set of presentations. Um, lots and lots of questions. So I'll try and just be very brief. Um, we've had quite a lot of examples from the UK. Um, and so I guess one of the things that's on my mind is what can what can the inverted commas north learn from the south and what can the inverted commas south learn from the north? And I don't agree with those terms, which is why I use the inverted yeah. commas. Okay. Um, and in particular, just sort of thinking about um, how you actually incentivize action. Is it is it policies? Is it tax? Is it regulation? Is it, you know, community driven? You know, is it is it the mayors in the cities, you know, and actually what that does to the power balance of kind of whose voice counts in these processes, you know, and how, you know, who gains and who loses is the question we've always been asking all week. And I just wondered if people wanted to comment about how that looks and feels in the urban environment. I'm particularly keen to hear from our colleague in China first, because I know she'll be tired. <laughs> and then, um, and then Jess, if that's all right, and yeah. then other colleagues from the yeah. UK end. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, Lin Jun is the right person to answer this question because she works in uh, China and in Europe. So Lin Jun, you go first. Uh, yeah, if, <laughs> if I catch that correctly, so I think there are two parts of the question. First is about the knowledge exchange from the north to the south, south to the north. And the second is about the incentivized actions I'll answer the second first because I think it goes back to one key message in my presentation is that context is very important. So for different contexts, the incentive, the catalyst or the incentive, effective incentive would be very different. So for example, here in China, what I uh, witnessed or what from our study found out is that uh, governmental actions are really strong. So if the government has a um, very clear targets for promoting, for example, Sponge City, then it will be very quick uh, spreading out across the country because it has strong, it has strong, uh, how to say, financial support from the, not only the national government, but also different levels of government from the provincial and the municipal, municipal governments. And then all the related actors, for example, those planning companies, designers, they will all act to think about, okay, what can we do uh, to fulfill the Sponge City program, come up with a project that will be included in the overall program and then get funded, for example. So state uh, uh, view is a really strong incentive here, but also what we witness is that uh, um, those grassroots initiatives are also taking also making great impacts as well. For example, in Shanghai, uh, community gardens actually comes from um, an academic in Tongji University leading uh, a collaboration with a business, uh, local developers, and they come up with the idea to transform a vacant land into community garden. And then this kind of practices has been spread, spreading out through engaging with the local communities, through collaborating with the local governments, and through these kind of um, grassroots activities, 
not only in Shanghai, but also in my hometown city in Nanning, they also uh, build up the partnership with those actors in Shanghai and try to grow their own community garden movements in the city of Nanning. So I think this again shows the potential or the uh, or the momentum from the bottom up, uh, not only from the top down uh, direction. So uh, in terms of the incentive, I think that depends on the context and also depends on the key actors of that cities. And in terms of the, uh, sorry. I'm going to interrupt you. I just want you to give a short answer to the next question, please. So if you if you could just say something then about what is it that is, I think the question is not so much about knowledge transfer, but what are the lessons, are the lessons that are applicable between the two? So would that work in Europe or is the European context different? Yes, very different, very short. <laughs> so yeah, because China Chinese uh, context is very different from the European one. So from our project, we also identify some uh, key stepping stones that are prominent in the European cities might not be that relevant here in China, for example, the biodiversity net game. Uh, it's not happening here in China yet, so that's not really, really relevant. But I think the methodology or the thinking um, that we have do, been doing in the Nature Vision project uh, help a lot in think about the uh, challenges, opportunities uh, here in China. So, yeah, that's my short answer. Thank you. Yeah, so I, should, I should probably plug the fact that you have written, because you haven't uh, plugged the fact that you have written a paper on how to mainstream nature-based solutions in cities in, in Europe. So that would be, so I'll plug that for Linda. <laughs> but Jess, maybe do you want to take that bit about is the, what is the learning about how can, you know, are the things the same about trying to implement nature-based solutions in the urban context in the global south and, the, yeah. and in the global north from your work? Um, yeah, I mean, the same, yes, they're very, very different, but there's almost like a little bit of an expectation, okay, we're going to be like the global north, and how do we get there? And so a lot of what, what I try and do is say, okay, we've got a completely different context, and how do we make those lessons work for us? So I think a, a big support would be that Africa needs to make their own case um, to, to build that evidence base so they can say, okay, this is the value add that we have through our nature-based solutions, um, and then take that to the global north, because I think so much of that's coming. So I think that's that's a big one. Um, and then also another kind of big lesson is, is around the finance. I know everybody in the world is struggling. How do you make adaptation bankable and nature-based solutions bankable and stuff? But I think there's there's still a lot in the finance systems in African cities that can be learned. So how is green procurement happening and how are how are systems and how is risk reduced so that African cities are viable? For that funding because at the moment you see the kind of processes and stuff and you're, i don't want to go there i'll work with the boundary agent and, and that kind of reduces my risk so that's also a kind of a th i think thing and then coming out of africa that that is 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 really good to learn is is they're very kind of more proactive because they haven't gone on that thing on that journey of, of kind of being locked into systems so they they can be proactive they can test these solutions, um, um, they can kind of experiment and, and all the rest of it. And I think that's really, really exciting. And that's something that I think Africa can offer. Um, and then just quickly on your incentive question, um, it's all, there's so many ways to kind of like, it's gonna cat, I don't wanna say that's yeah. a bad thing to say in the room, but um, you know, there's, there's so many ways to, to approach this. That in the conservation yeah, yeah, I know, sorry. <laughs> No skinning happening. No, no, no wild animals are being skinned on this stage. <laughs> um, yeah, there's so many ways to approach approach the problem. Um, I have definitely seen kind of the work we've done around community engagement and putting pressure to be part of decision making. Very, very critical. So that then, then they've got agency in a room to kind of help and guide decision making. It's been really, really kind of profound. Um, but then also just really like building relationships between key actors, national government and cities particularly is absolutely critical. Um, and so that's that sense, incentive there to build that is, is quite critical. Yeah. Sorry. I think this, this is the least out of power. So you keep with power because we still have a bit of our session to go. Thank you. I think there was a question here. Did you want to you can wait for the microphone? Thank you. It was pretty much the same direction, how we incentivize. So if you look in the urban context, where do we implement nature-based solutions? We implement them in the public places, in public buildings, but also there is a big share of private infrastructure that belongs to big companies, asset managers, asset owners. 
So maybe to make the question more concrete, in the public places and museums and public areas, I think it's much more easier to implement nature-based solutions in comparison to convincing the asset managers why they should implement nature-based solutions. So I was just keen if you have any experience in um, interacting with, with asset managers and um, trying to yeah also integrate them in the discussion and maybe they ended up implementing nature-based solutions. Maybe Rob, could you take that? Because I'm interested in that housing development that's decided to, to you know, it was very classic along the time through the 1960s to turn, or even before, to turn your back on the river because it was a polluted place. So that's like a classic uh, urbanization that the time has had for 100 years, right? But for this development then to turn its face to the river is quite an important one. And I just wonder what the private sector in, actors involved with that how did they go about that sort of transformation? Yeah, yes, I think that it, it's really interesting to, to think about the, how, how the private sector will react. So in that particular example, um, they, they knew because of the regulations. So I think good regulation really does work. And it's it, it's part of the question, part of the answer to the question before that. It, it's about learning what good regulate, regulation works in different parts of the world and, and borrowing that and, and making it better. So I would say that the regulation in this particular housing um, development, which is going to go ahead, really did make them think how to change their development, how to spend the money on the mitigation and the biodiversity net gain. So that, that was the real driver behind it. But also the, um, the local authorities and their local plans are really important in this because there's, there's things that aren't particularly in regulation that they can put into local plans that the local community want. So if somebody's coming along to do a development, they, they look at that local plan and if it's, if it's in there, They've got, to, they've got to try and implement that within the plan. Um, with the conversation with um, sort of asset managers, I was, I was talking to a, a big um, property um, owner. Um, the, the, unfortunately, they didn't have any in the area that I was working in, which was a bit of a shame after I spent two hours talking to them. But, but, they, <laughs> but they, they were really, really keen to be doing the right thing in their assets and looking at green roofs, um, green walls, putting in um, heat source um, energy. So, so they, they're wanting to do that because they know that the businesses they're trying to attract are now asking for that. So I think it's, it's that shift in what their customers want. And it, you know, it's not just what you're buying at the local supermarket and that procurement process now as well. It's, it's, it's businesses who are looking for you know, renting a property that gives them all that as well. So I think that's certainly helping move things forward. Um, I don't know if that really yeah. answers the question. I'm going to go to Elena next and then I'll hurry up, I'll ask you. But Elena, one of the things I was really struck with with your map of Glasgow was just the amount of derelict land and that association between derelict land, which is usually still owned by someone, right? It's an asset to a certain to a certain extent. And we know we have a lot of land banking in the UK. We know we have a lot of, of property developers who hold property vacant, often in rural areas, but also in urban areas for the changes in the property market that they want to see. And we usually think of more deprived communities in urban areas as being land poor or resource poor. But actually, this was a resource that you were able to kind of bring into, you know, yeah, bring into being a, a productive resource. Um, just, I think that's just really, it's really curious how that works. So that's a kind of, yeah, did you have to engage with a lot of private sector actors to get that to work? How did that, you know, What's your experience been? Yeah, it's it's a really interesting it's a really interesting one actually because vacant and derelict land is is quite prevalent in Scotland and a, and a great deal of it is within the central urbanised um, parts of Scotland as well. Um, well. That particular example that was on the slides there is is actually one of our project sites. It's our largest project site called Canal and North Gateway. And those sites in particular um, lay undeveloped for quite some time because of the pressures on the sewer system. They couldn't develop on it because there was no additional way of adding um, to the sewage system without building significant additional tunneling towards the two main rivers, um, as well as water purification um, systems for that. And it just was unviable. And what actually did happen in, in this instance is that whilst initially for our funded project, 
um, we weren't dealing with private actors. Um, the, the projects that we funded allowed for a natural solution to dealing with surface water management and the, the flood risk as well that exists there and downstream in central Glasgow as a result, um, which then unlocked the potential for development on those sites and then had a knock-on effect on other derelict sites as well. So there's a multi-phase program of development that's currently going on that was kick-started because of the, the nature-based kind of sponge city approach that was implemented there, um, which is really significant because these are really long-term um, derelict sites that just are not in any kind of productive use. Um, and and there's it's not just housing that's going in, um, there's schools going in, there's businesses going in, there's green space going in, there's a local nature reserve, there's all sorts. And um, it's a really nice example of how within a within a city where there is limited land available, where land can't be developed because of constraints on a, you know, a utility aspect like the sewer system, this is a really nice example of, of how the kind of nature-based solutions approach helped to unlock that and unlock those positive benefits for communities. So in, in that case, a nature-based solution wasn't like a nice to add, have added economic value on top of another yeah. asset, it actually would allow the asset to become productive. I think yeah, and what's interesting in this particular one is that the very first thing that was designed was the green infrastructure yeah. on the site rather than it being the last thing that goes in, which is typically the case after all the other infrastructures, it was the very first thing that was designed and everything else came into what was left rather than the other way around. Really interesting, thank you. And Harriet, I wonder, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that some of the community groups that you work with or that you go out and, and you know, at least engage with them, they're not all working in public spaces, right? I mean, some of them are like, they have private, they're in the sense, private community gardens as well. Is it, is it all public space that you engage with, or have you also engaged with like private sector sites? Um, so the ones that we work with, some have like, yeah, boundaries that they close off and they're theirs. Um, the spaces that came to mind in listening to the answers and the question were meanwhile gardens that started as reclaiming derelict yeah. site from a community and yeah. great to know who I had the slides up. Uh, the guy who started it started because it's in the Grenfell area and after Grenfell, a group of them started guerrilla gardening spaces as a way of dealing and trying to create something uh, yeah. positive is not quite the right word, but a way of dealing with the situation and, and being inspired then by the, the community that came around that and the sense yeah. of agency and reclaiming of space. And I think that's the same with yeah. a lot of I don't know, the adventure playground movement, it's it's space that was derelict and the community was like, actually, this is our space, let's do something positive with it. And some of that's still hanging on by its shoe thread and yeah. being undervalued. But also the, I have sort of, some of my experiences, the opposite of like, actually housing developments want to put money into making the area more sanitized, more well-managed, looking greener, more attractive, and how you then, look at not gentrifying yeah. past the community that's already there yeah. and how you create the spaces that are usable for the community the the spaces in the middle of an estate how does actually that have some investment in it so people use it and value it and want to be there and then how do you balance a small site the amount of use it gets like what do you how do you create engagement opportunities yeah. without the grass all disappearing and it becoming a mud site and how do you yeah create spaces for for nature to be but you still want kids to turn the logs over but if they're constantly turning them over there's no nature there so yeah that. how you manage those like they you talked also about the sort of diverse communities that you're engaging with and one of the other really interesting things that sort of resonated with me from your talk was about how you then want to make sure that diverse forms of cultural heritage are also represented and sometimes that might clash with the idea of, say, invasive species or foreign species that in a biodiversity community, we tend to kind of think like in terms of like, this is the kind of biodiversity or this is the kind of ecology or this is the kind of system that suits here because it has always been here. But when we come into an urban context, then we've got this sort of mix 
of diverse ecologies and diverse heritages that have to be, as you said, quite often accommodated that difference in relatively small spaces. So that must also raise some tensions, but also, I guess, opportunities. Yeah, yeah and also in your saying that the language and those sort of things, like if you've grown up aware of being pushed to the margins or being discriminated, terms like yeah, invasive or foreign yes. species, those things are just so off-putting. We might like, we watched a video where the, the speaker said, oh, inner city London, in that tone, introducing yeah. it. And it was with the, the youth panel. And we all like the video had a lot of good context. And we were like, oh, that's a rubbish term. I, I noted it, but I bought into what she was saying beyond that. But all the young people were like, nope, I'm gone at that point. Because that, those things, like that's a lived experience of time after time after time after time and so those subtle yeah. the small things that feel small to us and you can step over um you have yeah. to be really so yeah so we have to be careful about some of those things that we take for granted from certain kinds of language and where they land and what do they mean to a whole set of diverse people that we're going to be engaging with i guess so yeah please yeah we have some online questions i'm sorry to online questioners but the iPad in the room is out of power. It's going to be recharged soon. So in about five minutes, we'll be asking online questions. So just so that online people don't feel unloved. So in the meantime, please. Great. Thanks very much. Um, I just was thinking, reflecting on the conference as a whole um, to kind of formulate a question, but I wonder if in the opinions of the panelists, if we think that the urban context of nature-based solutions, if we are where we need to be on, on the agenda, of nature-based solutions in a bigger context, because I mean, this is not meant to be a criticism of the conference or anything like that, because I've enjoyed it very much. But um, I was quite surprised, for example, that you know, until today, that not really much discussion of the urban context has come up before. It's mostly in the context of rural development and things like that, which are very important. But um, we we know, as you said, Harry, in the beginning, that most people live in cities and and so on and so on. So I just wanted to provoke maybe some reflection, if if the panelists think we are what we need to be um, in this bigger discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's also, I had, I didn't mean to have a sort of slight chuckle to myself, but I did, because the process of negotiating the biodiversity convention at the moment, as some of you well know, is so, is, is really stuck. It's, and I don't, I, you know, I wish everybody involved all the success because we need it. But I did have to sort of just so, ah, so the urban target has been agreed and nothing else has. Okay, so so at least somewhere the urban target, the, the urban seems the easy part of biodiversity to do. But I think you're right to, to call attention to the fact that where do we think we are at the moment in terms of urban nature-based solutions, whether that's on the in the national context that you're working, in the international context that you're working. You said that you'd been through the environment, the, the strategy plan for the 25-year plan, and you hadn't found the term. So... Rob, what's your experience working here in the UK for the Environment Agency about where we are thinking about the relationship between the urban and nature-based Yeah, I think it's, it's a brilliant question and it, it's about numbers, isn't it, I think. And I think it's where, you know, it, it's carbon, it's, it's the 30 by 30, it's the big numbers that want to be hit and those targets and maybe the non-urban areas are probably more likely to hit those targets. But also, I think what, what we've got to have a nod to is that you know, the, the cities are where people live. And, you know, especially what we're going through now with austerity and, you know, cost of living crisis and um, certain communities don't have the ability to, to get out into nature and enjoy it. So it's really important to bring that nature back into the, the urban areas. And, and, and as, as panelists were saying, sometimes people don't even notice the nature that's on their doorstep. So it's it's all about connecting with them. And I, I think one of the really interesting things that I've got going through my head at the minute was we, we recently did a um, citizen's jury in um, a, an urban area of um, Newcastle upon Tyne, um, mixed demographic. Um, and we we brought them together to start and talk and get the conversation going. And it's really wet, wet the appetite of the communities and thinking about what they need to be involved with, with and what they can actually do to start and bring urban nature in, into into where they live, work, and play. So I think that the narrative's changing, and I think we're we're starting to to see it as a more important within the urban environment, especially what we've gone through with COVID. The example that I had on the screen there of a floating ecosystem, for example, on the River Tyne, it's not that that area isn't used during COVID. It was absolutely inundated with people, and it's used every day, all day. But people don't 
look at the nature that's there because there's very little. So we need to enhance it for them to, to, to understand what's there and enjoy it more. So I, I think urban is, is going up the agenda. And just, just very quickly, the, the, the thing that I would look at, we've mentioned a lot about um, landscape scale and um, also on the, the previous um, session, there was a lot about environmental land management systems um, and linked to food, et cetera. But there's also some really good regulation coming through with the local nature recovery networks in the UK, which are going to be as much as important in the urban area as they are in the rural areas about identifying um, really good um, and, and restoring nature and connecting it up. Now, it might be easier to do in the in the rural areas because you might have the, the land bank and hopefully, you know, the landowners that will hopefully agree to it. But it's going to be much more difficult in those urban areas. So I think, again, that's going to bring the emphasis back and hopefully we'll be able to get more urban nature back in. Lin Jun, maybe I can ask you, because China is often seen as an example where urban nature-based solutions really are on the certainly on the national agenda and often talked about. I mean, this sponge city idea, of course, has gone global. Uh, so where do you where do you think uh, we are with in terms of thinking about the urban side of nature based solutions from your perspective? No, I I I definitely agree with Rob that uh, urban um, nature based solutions are rising in the agenda. Uh, like you mentioned, Harriet, I think in China the cities has been uh, been a key actor for I think not recently, but in the past decades as well. The EcoCity initiatives started from early 2000s. And since then, there are various uh, urban initiatives uh, rolling out in Chinese cities, including the low carbon city, not only nature-based solutions, but the urban repairs um, and, um, well, and several small initiatives such as the forest cities and also the beautiful city various names but yeah so different initiatives those tend to you know drive a lot of uh projects on the ground not only supported by the government but also like i mentioned like promoted those all kinds of urban actors to think what they can do to actually fit in that agenda so they can get uh, not only the resources from the government but also to help to uh, build up their profile, uh, helping with their marketing for the business as well. So I think uh, definitely cities are key actors in, in Chinese cities. And, um, and I think uh, they already demonstrate the great potential for promoting nature-based solutions here in the Chinese context. Thank you, Lin Jun. And I mean, Harriet, I think, um, I th yes, well, slight confession, because when I met, first met Harriet, it was an invitation to go and speak about the Urban Nature Project. And I was just so curious about the idea that a natural history museum would be having something urban. It was probably something that I thought would never really happen. We don't really see natural history museums thinking about urban nature, right? So I wonder what sort of journey that's been for you at the Natural History Museum. Has it been smooth? Uh, has it been easy to kind of persuade the stakeholders and actors around the Natural History Museum that having an urban nature focus should be part of what the museum does? Um, so I joined sort of three, four, five years into quite a long process of getting the project through that I think linking with transforming the grounds, yes. like there was a buy-in for that. And the it was the scientists who led the wanting to look at what actually nature's doing in an urban thing. So I think there was buy-in. Yes. But what was interesting on the journey was that it started with this architectural plan of being this like statement piece. And they they wanted to tunnel down and create, they just created this really overly complicated, uh, very financially thing, solution, which had a lot of brilliant positives, but it didn't get much buy and it was going to take away the nature that was currently there. And I think that's sort of, yeah, looking at how these solutions get implemented and negotiated through. And if you've got a flagship thing, what does that mean? And how do you not go too far down the flagship and the, that side of it? Yeah. And then also it started before actually there felt like there was much debate about urban nature. Yeah. And now it feels like actually it is quite prominent in people's thoughts with their 
the UN having yeah. it, it's joined in with their targets and stuff. So yeah, it's partly at the museum. We're a bit like, oh, we missed the boat. If we got going at the beginning, we could have, yeah. yeah. Again, you have in the, the space. Boat. You yeah. are you're very yeah. much about. I mean, and Jess, you've been working now in networks of cities across the world for some time. And so you must really have a, an idea about how this has changed over time. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, exactly what everybody said. It's definitely um, at the international space and all the rest of us is definitely gaining prominence. I think the biggest issue that a lot of urban, people, urban spaces are having is in the how. How do we actually uh, mainstream it? This is why this session is so, so great. So how do you actually kind of balance it with great infrastructure projects in decision making space that are almost the norm and that's where funding is going grant grant funders want to see great infrastructure projects and nature-based solutions are tagged on and so it's more though that the, i think the devil's in the details of how rather than being um on the on the yeah, agenda because definitely on the agenda big time i think maybe what's interesting here is to think that it's it's on the agenda of cities but whether it's on the nature-based solutions agenda and all the other actors who are working in that space, yeah. I think maybe that's the other question. It's part of the question, right? So, so we're seeing that in, in the urban space, this is now increasingly normalized that nature-based solutions would be part of what urban sustainable development looks like. But there are lots of challenges in terms of diversity, gentrification, inclusion, getting the finance right. I mean, you know, all the kinds of challenges that we've talked about with other nature-based solutions are in the urban and then some, but it's still a question about how does that, you know, is this happening in a, like a really, really big urban silo <laughs> versus the other one? But I, I think this will be, you know, an ongoing challenge that we need to, to, to take forward. We've got a couple of questions online and Elena, I'd like you to ask you to, to take one for me if I might, which is about how, how and why did the local communities come to be so involved and invested in the projects that you're doing? Because what, how is it that we can then sustain that involvement over time? The question is really asking whether state-led approaches can work on their own. And I think all of the panel have shown that partnership and the involvement of communities is really essential. But I'm really intrigued by the amount of momentum that you managed to achieve with some of the communities that you've been working with. And it would be great to have your reflection on that. A very good question. Um, one of the simplest ways that we made it happen is we made it a prerequisite for being considered for an application um, of funding, really. Um, so within our application process that our projects had to go through, um, they had to demonstrate that they had already been engaging with the local community where the project would be impacting or taking place. Um, and demonstrate how they work together to help define what the project was going to do and why. So again, that evidence of need combined with what the what the what the community needs and wants. Um, and then looking forward, we also required um, the grantees to include in their application things like a communications plan, a community engagement plan maintenance plan, uh, monitoring and evaluation plan, all these things that looked ahead to what the project was going to deliver, how it was going to be delivered, who was going to deliver it. Um, and throughout that, we were constantly looking for the community to be central in that process. So it wasn't, you know, again, it wasn't a grantee determining what a community needed, but the opposite way, the community determined what they needed and the grantee made it happen. And it was a really nice way of creating a relationship between, certainly for our capital infrastructure projects where the majority of our grantees were local authorities, but also housing associations and the NHS, for example. A really nice way of connecting actors where sometimes there has been a history of mistrust or not working together. Um, and the form that this took de depended on the project. Again, we didn't determine how that needed to look. You know how that engagement needed to take place when we were looking for the quality of the engagement um the outcomes of that engagement um and the investment in that engagement really in terms of time um to to really assess whether we considered this to be you know a viable project to be delivered in the long term as well with outcomes that would last in the long term because that for us was really important that whatever outcomes were going to be delivered that they were going to be delivered 
in a lasting way, uh, not just for the few years that we provide money. Um, and, and so we've got different um, setups. We've got some projects where the local authority employed a community liaison officer. In one case, that person was from the very community the project was serving, so that was great. Um, they ended up going down the route of setting up a friends of group, so an incorporated group um, of volunteers and, and with representatives from all the key stakeholder groups in the community in that group and anybody else who wanted to be part of it. And, and they've got an active role. They had an active role from a pre-planning pre stage right through to current day um, in determining, you know, down to what was going on to the master plan. Um, uh, to the activities that are being delivered on the site, uh, right. enabling others to use it, um, and 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 really finding, you know, making connections to other sites now to to help them gain capacity to do similar things for their site, for their place, really. Um, so it, it really depends on the project, but it's it's been really interesting to start seeing the different the different Sorry. sites. That's great. Sorry to interrupt you, but uh, I have, a, you know three or four minutes left and, <laughs> and another question to, to get in, um, which I Jess, I wanted to put to you, which was a question which is about given the pressures on development and particularly sometimes land prices in cities in the global south in particular, um, either pressures from informality or pressures from high prices for, for urban land, is there really going to be room in cities for nature-based solutions? <laughs> Sorry, it was such a big question, Elena. You see why now I had to interrupt. <laughs> so. um, I guess, guess to answer your question, this is what I've been really battling with in the last year or so, is at what scale on nature-based solutions. Um, and I know that there's a lot of debate about benefits and maybe the, the larger ones are better and you should invest. Um, but what we've been trying to do with cities is, is a method called urban tinkering. I quite like it. And it's about like looking at a landscape and seeing nothing is useless in that landscape. And where can we bring nature-based solutions into existing work and all the rest of it, knowing, for example, like urban sprawls. So we plan nature-based solutions and then urban sprawls happened and then you can't, you know, relocation is, is, is just not on the cards for African cities. So you spend so much time investing and should we rather just be doing these urban tinkerings and, and linking with maybe a broader ecological corridor plan or something, but at a smaller scale. And I think, that's what has been proving more useful. It also has been relieving the burden of cities a bit to feel like they have to plan these big scale projects and seek funding for them and monitor them and, and maintain them and these little pockets. And then also giving the community ownership over those um, has been really, really beneficial. So to answer the question, it is a worry. And so we're trying to find ways to work in multiple scales yeah. um, with what's possible in, in the city. But that's also so re so relevant and resonant with your nibbling approach, Rob. Right? I mean, it's kind of similar. Yeah, yeah. tinkering, nibbling, or, or, you know, whatever <laughs> whatever takes your fancy, really. But it is you've, you've got to look for the opportunities where where they arise, and, and you may have a, a bit of public realm where you can do something, but you may also have a, a conversation with a with a developer or, or somebody who owns a building where you can you know persuade them to to put something in there as well. Um, and you know, I think in cities as well, it's it's there's envy um, between cities, and I, I think that can be that can be a great enabler for some <laughs> cities to you know to look to, to look further down the country. Or I know there's, there's a there's a there's a big discussion at the minute going on in Newcastle upon Tyne about becoming the Vancouver of the North. The Vancouver um, of the because North because they're looking they're looking at Vancouver and going we we, we like this. <laughs> you know that that could that work for our city? So there is that learning from other um, cities that are doing well and and in, in bringing it. But I think envy can definitely coming to it as well. So Lin Jun, can we tinker our way, can we nibble our way through Chinese cities as well? What should we do, tinker, nibble or plan? Um, combine. <laughs> That's why value in diversity is so important. I think we should recognize that there are diverse forms of nature-based solutions in cities and also there are diverse approaches um, that can mainstream and also make nature-based solutions really effective in cities. So yeah, I think nibbling, planning, uh, tinkling, they are all valuable approaches and should be implemented or experimented um, on the ground to find out whether they will fit in the Chinese cities context, for example. Thanks. 
Harriet, I suppose that's a lot about what you guys are doing as well. You're trying lots of different things out. Yeah, I think that's really important. That really resonated. I think you were talking about the opportunity to just try and the the doing it because someone else has done it and done it well is really like it's a thing that's so the museum wants to be world leading and they want to do everything because it's at this standard. But if you only ever go at this standard and yeah. don't do anything, you don't do, you learn by doing. And it, yeah, so you've got to try things and you've got to yeah be not afraid to to do yeah. stuff just do stuff because it's also like they want research of it's this versus it's this it's versus this it's versus this and you spend all your time doing the research whereas all of them are good just choose one good thing and do something start going so i think perhaps one of the lessons then from the urban session at this conference is just choose some things and do them and we would like more nibbling um, and more tinkering with nature-based solutions and that we think there's a lot of uh, capacity. Obviously, we would like the city's uh, piece to be you know, more prominent in the overall debate. But I think the way that cities are approaching nature-based solutions actually has some more general lessons to be shared with what other kinds of approaches to nature-based solutions are happening. They don't all have to be big. They certainly don't all have to be about carbon. You can have learning by doing and the involvement of communities in very diverse ways making sure that that diversity is really celebrated. I think some of those things are, are what I've taken away from the session. Now, I know that um, we're due back to the other venue for some closing words from Natalie, the rest of the conference. So we'll finish a couple of minutes early, but I would like to say thank you very much to all colleagues, especially to Linjan, who's up extremely late, and Elena, who is dealing with COVID at the same time. Very much um, thank you for joining, and also to everybody who, in their busy uh, diaries and all the rest of your commitments, made time to spend with us today. So thank you all very much for this.